not worry, it does not go away, you just learn to live with it, okay? Um, so let me, so this is, I was told by Derek that um, there would be no singing, I should give a technical talk, so here's a technical talk, and I'm going to tell you about something called refinement types, uh, which you may or may not have heard of, so here's, here's the deal. Now, technically, if you're really fast, you could actually follow along, because these slides are online, but here we go, so here's, uh, let's start with a piece of trivia, does anyone know what this is? If you've seen this talk before, you know. It is, in fact, the first bug, right? So this is what, um, I think it was Grace Hopper, in fact, who found this, um, you know, found the first bug that sort of jammed up a diode in the Harvard Mark II, and this is where the name bug comes. And of course, you fast forward to today, and, you know, not a day passes when you can sort of turn the newspaper. These are fake headlines, by the way. Uh, bug crashes major system, bug brings city to a halt, bug software, bug spill software secrets. You know, we've seen all of these, right? I don't, this, it, it's fine. You can hardly tell which one is real and which one is fake. So this brings me to the question of, you know, what, what do programming languages people do? And, you know, having, having been in this business for a long time, when I go to a party or, you know, I have a daughter who's two now, I can't stop talking about her, she somehow made her way into this talk as well. When I go to, you know, meet other parents, I say, what do you do as a programming languages researcher? This is my current answer. This is George Orwell, he wrote a famous book called 1984, which all of you should read. And frankly, this to me is what programming languages research is all about. So one of the great lines in that is, so he was not talking about programming languages, by the way, right? Uh, we will make thought crime literally impossible because there will be no words to express it. And of course, now, it's not just replace thought crime with bugs or badness or slowness or pick your favorite expression for something bad going wrong with programs. And this, to me, is what a lot of programming languages research is about. And, you know, we've made a lot of progress in this. There's a lot of fantastic modern languages. I apologize if your favorite language is not on this list. Um, but here's the, here's the catch, these, prop, you know, these languages have a bunch of fantastic features, they have static typing, which I love, um, they have first class functions, that's just everywhere these days, right? Immutability by default, they're great, they, they really make it quite difficult to shoot yourself in the foot. And yet, it is quite possible to shoot yourself in the foot, right? There's lots of ways um, programs written in these languages go wrong, and here are just some, you know, these are just some of the things that happen to me on a pretty routine basis. Uh, things like divide by zero, my personal favorite is People always say things like, well, if you program in ML, you don't see null reference errors. Yeah, that's because they're called not found, uh, you know, look up not found in the map errors, right? It's, it's basically the same thing, or pattern match failures. And of course, there's even more serious things. So one of the somehow lesser known secrets about modern function languages that, you know, at the end there's C. Well, there's stuff below C as well, but uh, in the end they're built on top of C. And if you screw up your pointers, there will be buffer overflows. It's quite easy to trigger buffer overflows in Haskell programs, and I'm guessing in ML programs as well. They can diverge, and of course, at the end of the day, you have you know, what my colleagues in software engineering call, call, um, call logic bugs, where at the end of the day, I want this program to sort a list or balance a tree or you know, compute somebody's salary or income tax, and does it do that? Right? So I want to express these as assertions. And so the goal of refinement types is um, is really to find a way in which you can verify, where you can have the programmer specify things that they care about in their program. So program-specific assertions, invariants, that would rule out the kinds of things we saw earlier. But yet, have them sort of be able to check those in a very effective and automatic manner, right? Without having to write down a lot of proofs. This is the kind of overall goal. Let me look at where I am on time. Oh, not too bad. Okay, fantastic. So how do we achieve this? So let me just tell you, I'm going to give you a really, this has been, this, like, I've been working on this for 10 years, but there have been like a dozen other groups that have been working on this on 10 years. So I'm going to give you a really quick um, snapshot, an overview of this, of this area of research, right? So first, I'll tell you about what, ref what, what is a refinement type, or what do I think a refinement type is. Um, so, I'll, you know, a few typing rules and so on. Then I'll show you what it feels like to use this in practice, right? And then, you know, if there's time, I'll give you a couple of, um, a couple of recent ideas that we've had that I think are really quite cool. And then I'll sort of summarize with, uh, you know, where we are right now, what are some of the other people working in this space doing. Okay, good. So let's move on. So what is a refinement type? Very simply, a refinement type is you're going to take a plain old, you know, Haskell, ML, pick your favorite language type, like int bool string, and decorate it with logical predicates. Okay, so here's, here comes an example. Uh, or, well, here comes some formalism first. So we'll start with, say, basic types, like integers, booleans. You'll throw in type variables, A, B, C. And then what we're going to do is, so the, the thing to keep your eye on is this base type. So I'm going to write that as x colon b, where b is one of those base types like int bool, et cetera, et cetera, such that some predicate p holds. 
And one of the things that I obsess about, but many of the other people working in this space don't obsess about as much as I do, is that P belong to a decidable logic. Okay? Okay, so that's a refined base type, and then we build up more interesting things from that by writing function types which look like x such that t produces as output another t. And I'll show you examples of this in just a second. Okay? So since we're at Popple, I feel you know, a few typing rule things are kind of um, you know, called for. So let's, let me show you a few. You know, we'll do a little bit of slightly formal things before we get into uh, concrete examples. Right? So these predicates for me belong to this logic of uninterpreted functions and linear arithmetic. So for those of you who know what that is, fantastic. For those of you who don't, it's basically you have variables, you have numbers, you have linear arithmetic, which is multiplication, addition, and so on. All of those are actually not that interesting. What's really interesting is this business of an uninterpreted function. And I'll show you examples of that in a second. So, it, so just think of it as f, which is a function symbol applied to some expressions. And the nice thing about uninterpreted functions is that this is the only thing you know about an uninterpreted function. That's why it's called uninterpreted. You only know that if x is equal to y, then f of x is equal to f of y. That's it. You know nothing else. I don't know how these functions behave other than that. Now, this sounds like a you know, pretty strong restriction, but the nice thing about this restriction is that these SMT solvers are very, very good at reasoning about formulas that are over this particular logic. So what do I mean by reasoning about the formulas? Well, imagine I have a grammar of, of, of predicates. So predicates are going to be atomic fragments like E less than E, where E are expressions. And then I have Boolean combinations, and or not, et cetera, et cetera. So now if I have fragments of, of formulas like this, then I'm going to have something called a verification condition, which I will show you in a second. And these verification conditions are essentially logical formulas of the kind we saw earlier, of the form P1 implies P2. And what SMT solvers can do is they can decide if P1 implies P2 is valid. Now I could bust out a whole bunch of formal definitions for what is valid means, but effectively it means is always true, no matter what assignment you give to the variables x, y, z that may appear inside P1 and P2. Okay? Fair enough. So how do we use all this stuff? Where, where, what is this buying us? So let me show you an example of a really simple refinement type. So I'm going to define a type called 0. And 0 is simply the integers, value, value which is an integer such that the value equals to 0. Okay? So you can get the sort of general intuition of what that means. What I want this type to describe is the set of values that satisfy that particular predicate, which in this case is exactly the number 0. Right? So, um, here, so let me just, so I've, I've sort of checked this program already. If I change this and I make this 10 and I try and rerun this, then um, it's going to say, no, 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 10 does not type check. Yes, it is an integer, but it does not satisfy the condition value equals 0. Okay, so far so good? Okay, good, let's move on. Um, there's a couple of interesting things to notice already, right? So here's another type. I can define the natural numbers as just values that are greater than or equal to 0. And now here's where interesting things start to happen if you've been working in the program, if, if, if you've been working in the program verification world, and you don't know what, what's, like, why do I care about types? This is what types are really good for, is that they, they sort of let you compose specifications in a really cool way. So for example, this thing over here, nats, is the list 0, 1, 2, 3. And the way I describe a list of numbers, all of which are positive, I just use the list constructor and I say it's a list of nats. It's, it's completely obvious, right? But if you try and do this in just a classical whore logic, this turns out to be a really complicated thing because you have to bust out sophisticated logics. Decidability goes out of the window. Life becomes problematic. And so what we're going to do a lot with refinement types is we'll start with these really simple predicates like greater than zero, less than zero, and you know, slightly more interesting things. And then we'll sort of hop onto the type bandwagon, and it's going to let us write very, very expressive specifications. OK, so let's keep going. So now you know, we're still in the theory part of the, part of the exposition. So here's a question. What exactly is the type of zero? I just showed you that zero has the type value equals zero. But obviously, zero is also a natural number, right? So what, what's going on? So this is one of these strange things with refinement types, which is that an expression can actually have many different types. And here's what's happening. Okay, so a little bit, of, a little bit more theory. The, the key idea in refinement types, and this goes back at least to the 80s, uh, I think uh, New Pearl and then it was in PVS, is a notion of what is called predicate subtyping. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a typing environment, which is the usual kind of typing environment, the variables that are in scope. And we'll say that in an environment gamma, a type T1 is a subtype of a type T2 if, intuitively, the set of values described by T1 is a subset of those described by, C, by T2, right? So here's what's going on. Is you can think of gamma as describing a bunch of, a, a bunch of variables that are in scope. So that's going to be variables x1, x2, x3, x4. Each of these variables is going to have a logical constraint of its own. Let's call them P1, P2, P3, and P4. 
And what I'm going to say is that in such an environment where the XIs have these types, whoa, sorry, my bad. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, have this type. The type V such that Q is a subtype of V such that R if the logical formula Q implies R. Okay, hence the name predicate subtyping. Okay, and then you know you can you can tie this in with the denotational semantics and so on and so forth. Okay, so let's move on. So what is this bias? So now the reason that zero is a subtype of NAT is because you can prove, or rather the SMT solver can prove that when value is equal to zero, that implies that value is greater than or equal to zero. Right? Pretty straightforward. Okay, good. Where are we on time, by the way? Fantastic. Let's keep going. Okay, and so this is why you can type that you know zero is a subtype of NAT. Let's keep going. So here's a slightly more interesting example. I'm going to say 4 is equal to x plus 1, where x is equal to 3. And somehow my system has shown that, well, 4 is also a NAT. And of course, if I change this, for example, if I make this uh, minus 10 or minus 12, then I would get a type error, as, you know, because that's no longer equal to a NAT. So what just happened over here? So this is really the other interesting sort of theoretical bit that's with refinement types, which is the notion of what is called uh, dependent application. Right? So this is from from dependent types. So here's the idea. Again, in my typing environment, if a function f has the type s goes to t, and if the argument y has the type s, then the result of the function call is simply take the output type of, of f and replace all occurrences of x with y. So replace the formals with the actual. So again, if you're from the sort of whole logic world, it's completely straightforward. Just take the post condition, substitute the, the, the input parameters with the output, right? So, Returning to our example, if the, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to type plus as it takes as input A, which is an integer, it takes as input B, which is an integer, and returns a value that's equal to A plus B. And if X has the type, well, X is just an integer, 1 is just an integer. When the function call happens, the output has the type B equals X plus 1, right? And so now when I come back over here, the reason this code type checks is because X plus 1 has the type V equals X plus 1 in an environment where X equals 3. And so now when you again convert it into that, that implication, you get x equals 3 and v equals x plus 1 implies v is greater than 0, which is the case. Right? And if I change this to minus 12, then that implication breaks. Pretty straightforward, right? And this is, this is pretty much it. This is, this, is the, this is the bulk of it. The rest is pretty straightforward uh, type systems. Okay, okay good. So that's, that sums up phase 1, which is refinement types 101. Um, the high-level bits are types are simple, sorry, refinement types are you start with base types, you dress them up using logical predicates. And part two is the way you make refinement checking happen is first you have this notion of predicate subtyping, which just boils down to implication over these, these, these predicates, which is why I care that the predicates are from a decidable logic. And then this notion of dependent application that lets you build up the type for, for expressions from their components. Okay, fantastic. So now let's look at some examples. Okay, so this is probably the interesting part of the talk, and how much time do I have? 14. I should have been, I'm running five minutes late already. Well then. Um, oh, well, such is life. Um, let's keep going. <laughs> I'll just, you know, we just throw out the last half. It'll be fine. Okay, good. So the roadmap for this bit is the following. I'm going to show you first how one writes interesting specifications. It's not that exciting to prove that 4 is a NAT, let's face it. Um, then I'll show you how verification works on these more interesting examples. And then I'll show you how we can just go from, spec from checking to inference in, in a really simple step, right? It, it's really not a big deal. And then we look at some more examples. Okay, so the first specification, I'm going to use what is, you know, I would call it the sort of hello world example of refinement types, which is, let's just look at array bound safety. Now, this, I personally, it's not something I'm super excited by, uh, but it is quite important, and it's something that's very easy to describe. So it fits the bill for a 20-minute talk. Okay, so here we go. So what do I mean by inbounds array access? Well, Let's pretend that I'm working with vectors or arrays. You can you know, use whatever word you like. And what I'm going to say is that each vector has associated with it a property, which is how big was that vector? Are there 100 elements, 500 elements, so on and so forth, right? So I'm going to write a function called vlen, which is now we don't know, we, we don't care about how it's implemented at all, right? Somehow we have some way of saying a vector A has this particular size, which is going to be an int. Now, what do specifications look like? So I, can, I would imagine that my vector library, which is often actually implemented in C, exports functions like this. It has, an, it has a lookup function, which I'm calling at, just because I like really big fonts, and, and so I want to keep my uh, identifier small. And let's look at the type of at. It says that it takes as input a vector v, it takes as input an index i, which must be a natural number, and which must be less than the length of v, and gives you back an a value, right? where a was a vector of a. So that's one of the interesting 
uh, functions. And this is a, think, you can think of this as a precondition on the, on the type of the lookup function. And then you might have a post condition, which is say the size function. How do I know how big a vector is anyway? Well, I would have a size function that takes this input a vector and gives me back a number which is exactly equal to the length of that vector, right? So just by putting the constraints on the inputs and outputs, I can get sort of in, uh, preconditions and post conditions on functions. Great. So now let's look at a really simple function and how we might verify it. So here's a function that takes this input a vector and adds up all the elements in the vector. And lo and behold, there is an error in it. Can somebody tell me what the error is? I went past one past the end, right? So here's, here's where I, I kind of, um, you know, this is your classic off by one. I should not be less than or equal to size. I have 10 minutes left. Nine minutes left. Thanks, Ishil. Um, and so what I want to do is I just want to knock this down. And then when I check it, it all works out, right? So notice what I've done over here is I, I have this little recursive function. It's just looping over the, it's looping over the vector. It's not super exciting. Um, and I've written down this precondition that says loop takes a nat and gives you back an int. And how exactly did this get verified? Well, here's how, right? So if you look at this, uh, if you blow out this function, there's really three interesting places where stuff is happening. I'm going to call them A, B, and C. And, you know, we essentially have that same predicate subtyping business. At each of those three places, what you end up with is three sort of proof obligations. So at position A, where I pass zero in, I want to make sure that zero is a nat, so I get this condition. B equals zero is... Uh, is, satisfies this condition, right? This is at position B where I recursively call loop. I want to check that V equals I plus one is still a nat. That's what's going on over here. And finally, at the place where I index the array, I get this check that V equals I must satisfy the inbounds condition in this particular environment, right? Where I know that I is less than N, where N has been constrained to be the size of the array. Okay, so I get these three conditions. I ship them off to the SMT solver. This is all in my logic. I win. Okay, great. That's pretty quick. Let's look at how inference happens. So I have, uh, you know, I, I used to have a really hard time motivating inference, and then I came across this really nice quote from Benjamin Pierce, who is standing right there, and I don't know if he's feeling slightly embarrassed about this quote, but it has a kind of lyrical haiku-like um, feel to it. The more interesting your types get, the less fun it is to write them down. Okay, and I entirely agree with this sentiment. And so what I would really like to do is to not have to say that those are nats. I would just like to leave those as blanks. In fact, I'm putting these underscores here just to show you that that there's something that I'm not writing, but really I'd like to just delete those entirely and then check this program and have it all work out, okay, which is what's happening here. So what just happened? Why did I not have to write the NAT down? Well, here's why. It turns out it's just a really simple trick. Well, it, re it, re it relies upon about 30 years of research in something called abstract interpretation, um, but at the end of the day, it's a really simple trick, and here's the idea, right? At all those places, where I want to know what the refinements are. Remember, we're in Haskell or ML now, and I know what the basic types are. They're int or bool or alpha or what have you, right? Uh, Hindley Milner's already given me those. All the places where I don't know what the refinements are, I'm just going to make up variables. This is how my mother taught me algebra, and this is what the point of algebra is. Where you don't know something, you make up a variable, you call it x, and then you make up a bunch of constraints on it. So I'm going to pretend that I don't know what that is. It's, I satisfy some condition, I don't know what. I'm just going to call it a k. And then when you repeat that entire type checking procedure, what you end up is, you get these constraints on that k that look basically like this. Wherever I used to have v greater than zero, the nat thing, end up with a constraint like this. And now again, you know, I'm, I'm compressing a whole bunch of work into like 12 seconds, but this is what happens. These are called horn constraints. There's a little crank, you turn that crank, and you can solve it out to get the solution, right? So um, this is a, it's, it's, it's a nice idea. It's called predicate abstraction, which is a form of abstract interpretation. And it turns out to be very, very important for us because it, it, it prevents us from having to do a bunch of typing. Where am I? Oh, six minutes, plenty of time. Not at all, actually. Okay, so let me just show you one quick example. This was kind of boring because, you know, we're in languages like ML and Haskell, so you're not supposed to be writing functions that iterate over loops in this, uh, in this very sort of intro programming way. So instead, of course, you know, we have all been taught we should, uh, you know, favor composition over raw recursion. And so instead, what you would want to do is write a function. I think, who, what, is it, what does Richard Bird call it? Indexitis. You shouldn't be manipulating, you know, one by one array offsets, right? So instead, what you ought to do is work with collections. So you might want to write a function like range that takes a low and a high and gives you a list of numbers between low and high, right? Like in Python or, or you know, whichever language. Then you would want to write things like a fold write function that, you know, traverses these collections and sort of reduces them, them down. And when you do all that, Here's what you would really write, uh, you know, here's how we, you would really write sum as this very simple fold over this range, right? So you would say take the vector, generate the collection of its indices, 
and then simply call uh, the add function and fall right. And it works. You know, to cut a long story short, it just works out fine. Um, and the reason it works out fine is I'm trying to find the right thing over here, is the, 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 in, the, the refinement synthesis procedure has figured out that in this case, in fact, add is being called with values, with indices that are between 0 and VLAN. And this is really just this, this magical combination of types and abstract interpretation. It's, it's really quite cool. OK, I'm out of time. Is that right? I have four whole minutes. OK, fine. Let me just show you one last thing. Um, since I made such a song and dance about, uh, what are they called, uninterpreted functions, let me tell you why they're really cool. So I, I, I said why I really don't like pattern match errors. In, in ML programs, and here's how you might get rid of them. So here's a function, it computes the average of a list, it adds up, it calls fold right to, to add up all the elements in the list, and then it calls this length function to divide that, that total sum, right? And now the th system is complaining, if you squint at it, it'll say that, well, I expect it's a division, it's gone off the screen. If I make the font smaller, you'll see at the very top. It doesn't know that this n is in fact non-zero. And why would it? Because I just computed the length of this list, so why is it non-zero? So what we end up doing to solve this particular problem is that we can, we can convert that length function, we can just lift it up into the logic. So what I'm going to say is, from now on, think of length as something you can use in your specifications. And now we can just go back and put in a precondition here that says, um, blah, 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 this is not a list, but it's a non-empty list of integers. I promise you that I will not call you with empty lists. I will only call you with non-empty lists. And now this error goes away. And the reason for that is now it's essentially synthesized that length is going to return, well, a non-zero value. And so the division is, is quite safe, right? Now, the reason this all works out is because what we've done is we've, synth we've strengthened the types of the data constructors. This is where the type system is helping us a lot. We're saying that nil simply returns a list whose length is zero. Cons takes, two takes, a, takes an element in a list and returns as, in, as output a list whose length is one greater than the type of the input. And that's it. The SMT solver, the decision procedure, knows nothing about length other than these facts that have been tucked inside the data constructors. And from then on, it, it all works out, right? So, um, you know, you could try and do this at home and we move on, right? So, to recap, what we did is you can specify properties as functions over these data types. So I should say this is a restricted class of functions. And then the type system just tells you how to unfold these functions in exactly the way the type system does it, which is at fold and unfold, so at, at places where you match, where you construct the data type. Okay, now I promise that I will finish. And so let me just skip over my favorite part of the talk and get to, uh, you know, catch me afterward. Yeah, I should conclude, right? I think that's a civilized thing to do. Um, okay, so let me just tell you, uh, let me wrap up. Let, let me wrap up. So let me just tell you about our, you know, where, where are things right now? So we built this thing called Liquid Haskell. It's very nice. I really like it. We've thrown out a bunch of code bases. It's pretty fast. These are all programs that we didn't write. They're pretty fun programs. Um, we, we can prove these kinds of things, right? So a lot of these actually are built on C libraries, so we can prove memory safety. We can prove that there are no pattern match errors. We can prove that everything terminates in, in all of these libraries. And there's various sort of functional correctness guarantees that one can uh, establish about these. Um, you know, there's, there's the names of these libraries are off on the left. The interesting bits are these ratios between the blue part, which is the code, and the green bits, which are the stuff we had to write to specify and verify uh, various properties, right? And this is quite a reasonable thing, in my opinion. One line of specifications per 10 lines of code, that's fine in my book. Compile times, unfortunately, need something, leave something to be desired, and this is an area of active work. Um, OK, I'm wrapping up now. So remember, these were my goals. I want to be expressive as well as automatic. And really, if, I, you should go to a whole bunch of talks at Popple, and this is roughly the landscape as I see this. Fully automatic static analysis, which is super automatic, but not that expressive. Some set of people have will tell you these are the properties we're going to check. And at the other end, you have cock where you can, the sky is the limit. Actually, even the sky is not the limit. Um, you, can, you can pretty much specify whatever you like. Math is the limit, right? And what we're looking at is something that sort of pushes the automation towards cock. We probably never get there, right? Because I obsess so much about automation. But we're trying to sort of push closer and closer there. Um, so as I said, let me skip that. Um, there's a whole bunch of different groups working on this. There's going to be a bunch of papers actually at Popple that I strongly encourage you to go to. A lot of this work was inspired by projects out of Carnegie Mellon, so the ATS and DML uh, and, and Stardust. Then there's, there's a group at Purdue working on Catalyst. They've been doing a bunch of cool things at recent ICFPs. Uh, the F7 and F-Star team at Microsoft have a paper at this Popple. I'm this close. Uh, and then there's a bunch of new things coming out. So there's a paper I saw on Archive recently. There's a group out of MIT 
that is, I'm so excited by this, because people always think of types as this defensive thing where, well, we're going to prevent bad things from happening to our program. But what I like about this SyncWid project is that you just write down the type, and then it grinds out. It produces a whole bunch of code for you. So this is just it's like types on the offensive. You know, it's, it's very cool. Um, it's on archive. You should check it out. Actually, that's a link. Um, OK, I should point out, of all of these, the F star people have, F7 and F star people have just done amazing things with, with cryptography and security. So you should definitely go and see their talk on Friday. I think Asim is, one of them is floating around. There he is. Oh, Catalin. Hi, Catalin. Uh, OK, and that's it. I said I'd stop. I'm only 60 seconds over. Thank you very much. is uh, not decidable. Um, so what in particular makes primate types uh, more obvious? Well, it's this, as I said right off at the very beginning, we obsess on picking our refinement, ensuring that our refinements are drawn from a decidable logic. So with dependent types, you can basically, your, your logic is unconstrained, in the sense that you can, arbitrary, arbitrary functions can now be used as specification. Right? While in our case, we, I mean, we really restrict that. that that's where it's coming from. Right? Yes. No. We have our own horn for solver for that. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, first of all, it's actually quite parametric in the underlying theory because really the only thing the solver needs to care is that you need to have these implications, and you need a notion of substitution. That's basically it. And so then you can, you know, all the hard work of doing the theory reasoning is done by the SMT solver. And so anything the SMT solvers do, and the more things you add. So for example, I didn't show you this, but one of the things we found very handy is the theory of sets. Uh, again, the quantifier free theory of sets. So a lot of our functional correctness specifications come out of that. Happily, that is also decidable. It was not on that slide sets, bit vectors, et cetera. So we get a lot of mileage from a bunch of those theories. And it's quite straightforward to add new theories as well, because the solver itself just cares about substitution, really. Yeah? I say when I should cut people off. Yeah? And so this is really cool. And it seems to work well for like building types, like lists and numbers <coughs> and so on. And developers who want to like grow the language and add their own libraries, can they somehow Oh, yeah. So I guess that was in this fun part that I skipped. Um, but <laughs> such is life. Um, certainly. So the, I mean, these are not limited to lists at all. So, as, so the bit that I skipped is that what I showed you is that look how we are tucking a bunch of refinements inside the type definitions. Yes. And then what we do is not, as you write your own type definitions, have at it, right? So you can actually get a lot of mileage by pushing these constraints inside type definitions. Um, one of the really cool things that, well, the, even the slide projector has given up on me now. But that we let you do is actually even abstract over refinement. So what I can say is here's a list, and this list is the variables in this list or the values in this list satisfy some refinement p that I'm not going to tell you what that refinement is. And so you can then you can say that for all conditions p, you give me a list of things that satisfy p, and you get back a thing that's anyway. Long story short, yes, it lets you build up a whole bunch of interesting abstractions. So one of my favorite examples that's actually on this slide that I didn't cover is how you can actually encode pretty sophisticated things like the type. You can actually encode the type. Inside the type of whole, you can encode mathematical induction over lists. And it's, it's quite nice. It sounds kind of a, a nerdy thing to do, but it's, it's pretty fun. Thank you. OK, thanks a lot. And I'll be floating around so you can ask me more questions. <laughs>